Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Ethan Curtis of Vandrer Knives. Ethan's work first caught my eye on Instagram, where his handmade fixed blade knives struck me as equal parts self-defense and utility, with a look that harkens back to old Northern Europe. Since I first started paying attention to Ethan's knives, they've progressed from cool, rugged-looking tools to beautiful and refined knives. And in that time, I've watched his range in terms of design grow, with some models seeming universally uh, purpose uh, purpose-driven and others utilitarian, but you know how I love the purpose-driven. What's more, I've gotten a hint of Ethan's inspiration and personal background and can't wait to hear how he's used that to build a career in knives. But first, like, comment, subscribe, and share this show. Also, you can download it to your favorite podcast app. As always, you can check out our Patreon uh, account on Patreon and help support the show. Quickest way to do that is to go over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ethan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on, Bob. It's my pleasure. I, I realized as I was uh, reading my intro that I botched the name. And then once I realized that, it threw me off. It's Van Rare Knives, right? Yeah, Van Rare Knives. Yeah. All right. So let's start right there. What does Van Rare mean? Uh, it means wanderer in uh, Norwegian. So that's a, that story, that name is a, a story in and of itself. Well, okay. Well, let's start right there. What What is the story behind Van Rare, the, the name? So I actually started this company in early to 2020 and uh, it was kind of, I didn't know much about knives. So I started it with my dad and my brother um, and I was doing more. We actually used to be named Northern Breed Knives and that was our original name. Well, our plan was to run it together um, and me and my brother just have so, our styles are so different that um you know, we just kind of want to do our own thing. And if you check him out, you'll see that we're kind of worlds apart on how we do and design things. And so uh, we wanted to come up with a cool name. Most of our knives started, we started with a sax and a warm cliff. And so we wanted to stick with kind of like that Viking style theme. And um, my wife is a nomad. I mean, we've, we've moved all over. I've lived in North Carolina, Georgia. We met in Tennessee. We've lived in Alaska, which is really where our company kind of took off. And, um, and so I wanted to come up with something along those lines. So we, uh, named it Vanner and Ives, um, basically Wanderer and Ives. And, um, so yeah, that's just kind of us, you know, my wife would move every five months if she could. And so, uh, I just <laughs> devoted this company to her and cause she's really been the supportive piece behind it. So I had to give her a little piece in there, you know, of course the power behind the power behind the throne as they say but what uh so all of those places uh many of them in the south but alaska that's a that's a, a uh, uh that's a, a different one thrown in there of all those places that you've wandered uh what did you find find the most inspirational for your knife making so i mean alaska is really the the crux of where we are in fact if you look on my page we still kind of claim that because that's where i really found my style and identity and knives it's where most of my growth came from and um really i was out in the wilderness a lot more up there than down here i mean i don't even have trees in my backyard here so it's it's a little bit different but that's alaska is really the place that built us and it's really where we started and uh, so I attribute a lot of, of where I'm at right now to Alaska, which is why you'll still see that on my page. From, uh, I don't plan on taking that down anytime soon. So, Where in Alaska were you? We lived in Wasilla. Uh, it's about an hour north of Anchorage. Okay. So uh, I rem my mom and my sister went to Alaska on a, on a 
uh, mother daughter trip uh, about 10 years ago at this point. And I just remember burning with jealousy. And I was like, well, I know I'm not a daughter, so I can't go on this trip. But Alaska, I've always wanted to go up there and I haven't been there yet. What about Alaska? What about it up there is such a draw to so many people? It, I mean, it, it is what it says it is, the last frontier. I mean, there's something about, um, you know, there's wilderness everywhere. And the cool part for us was, is, you know, it, it's it's really like its own world. I mean, you get up there and you're driving down the road and then you've got four wheelers driving on the side. They have their own road and then a pedestrian road up there uh, on the other side. And so you kind of get used to seeing, um, you know, snow machines and four wheelers all time of year and it's the coolest part about it was the animals no doubt i mean we were sitting in our living room and a moose came up and just put its nose on our glass and and you know there's been several times we had to get our dogs back because the moose would come out and charge at them and stuff and so it's it's like living in the wild wild west except you know five times bigger than every other state in america so well, to those of us, you know, I'm a Yank. I grew up outside of Cleveland and, you know, I've, I've lived near or in major metropolitan places basically my whole life. And I always imagined a moose to be, you know, kind of like a deer, just shaped differently, but that's not the case. No, they're, uh, they're about three or four times the size of a moose. I mean, my first experience was we pulled up in my, my parents' house up there and a moose was by my dad's Dodge uh, 2500 and the back was as tall as the top of the truck. So, I mean, you know, it, it's kind of, when you grow up around white-tailed deer like I did, seeing a moose is, I mean, it's a completely different world. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's really cool. Um, the cool thing about it was we had mountains all around us and we could just go hiking, especially in the summer because you don't have any dark, you know, you get about three hours of darkness and you can hike till midnight if you want. So, it's definitely its own experience for sure. So that's where you kind of had your coming of age as a knife maker. That's, I guess, where you really uh, began to um, investigate deeply and start uh, where you came up with your first knife model, I think the Odin. Um, mm -hmm. So how, how did that landscape and that experience um, inspire the design and the way you built that knife? Well, the, the Odin was actually a design that me and my brother made originally. Um, I, I didn't know anything about knife design. I didn't know anything about knives at first. And um, we just knew kind of a simple concept that we wanted to go with. And um, he put some things on there. I was working bail enforcement when we first started. And I wanted a glass break on a knife and uh, a couple other things. And that really is what started that. And at the time you know, being new into knives, I wasn't even really a fan of the Warren Cliff style at the time. Um, now, if you ask me, it's the only knife I'll carry. Uh, it's pretty much the only style I carry. Um, and, but um, yeah, having that Odin really, we shaped it a lot because I, I was wearing heavy clothes and I didn't really want to carry a heavy knife. And so I started modeling my knives after what I was carrying on a daily basis concealed carry. So I wanted them smaller, lighter. Um, and I wanted to take up less space on my waistband. Um, especially cause sometimes you can get hot up there and sweat and I didn't want to rust blades cause I don't, you know, at the time I didn't know anything about stainless steels. I was just 1095 was all I was using at the time. Um, and so that kind of structured the start of why we were making knives the way that we were making them. And, uh, the Odin has come a long way. If you look at our our um, logo, you'll actually see the Odin um, design is right beside the Viking head. And so it's crucial to the landscape of who we are as a company. Um, it was never our best selling knife, but I just love it so much, you know, so it'll always be in our lineup. Always the, always your first love. What, um, what, why the, yeah, I can see that. That's pretty cool. That's right uh, in the front of the, the profile of the Viking there. So why the Warncliffe? Uh, I, I, and I totally, I am a lover of the Warncliffe and, and the historic sacks and the scramma sacks and all that. Um, but I remember when in the knife world, um, Warncliffe's first started becoming very popular and I, they made me, I don't know, they made me uncomfortable. I was like, this looks like, I don't know. I don't understand. So why, why Warnies for you? Um, the main thing for me is I love control over the tip of a knife 
and it's a lot easier for me to have that control with that style of blade. Um, and even on some of my new ones, like my Fenrir, you'll see that I profiled the knife down. It's more of like a modified bird beak, but uh, this, I just have felt like the straight edge gives you the best for slicing, cutting, and um, I've used it. I, I used it at first because that's how we designed it, you know, and, and I was like, this will grow on me, and eventually it did. I mean, if I make a knife that's a different profile, I sell it. Um, uh, and where some of these new like one cliff styles or even sack styles, I'll keep the first model for myself. And, and, uh, you know, because I just, the blades really grown on me and I, I, for my uses as an everyday tool, I have felt like it accomplishes what I need more so than, you know, your curved edge blade that you're going to use for hunting or things like that. So. So how did that benefit you? I'm really interested in this uh, bail bonds or, or, or bond um, bond enforcement <laughs> on a lark um, many years ago at this point, 15 years ago or so. Uh, I got my um, my process servers license just because I was working with a dude in video who was a tough guy and he did that on the side. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I do martial arts. I could do that. And I never, ever once did it, but I had this sort of romantic notion of that sort of side of things. And, and I would imagine bonds enforcement it has a similar, similar, but way more dangerous kind of feel to it. How, how were knives incorporated in that line of work and, and how did the, the Warncliffe shape in particular benefit how you, what you were doing? Well, so at first it didn't, and that's kind of what I, you know, I didn't really have an attachment to the Warren Cliff. The Warren Cliff was more like it was, you know, when me and my brother were talking about starting Northern Breed Knives, it was we wanted to make Viking style knives. And so he incorporated his style with mine. We put the glass break on it. And really the glass break was what I was going for because um, we were, the reason I got into them is I couldn't afford a good knife. It's still to this day I can't. So I made my own, right? And, um, so I, I wanted to have a good knife on my belt because, you know, they were cheap and they weren't accomplishing what I needed to accomplish. And so I wanted a glass break on one and I made one um, because of an experience that we came out of. I mean, I had a guy almost uh, run me over in a car and uh, my partner was trying to break into the window and, and he couldn't get in. And so that was where it started. Um, and, and, and then it just grew into this thing where it's like I gave up bell bonds because I wanted to make knives after that, you know. And so it started out of a need. In fact, if you, our, our mission statement is uh, made from necessity, built for a purpose. Um, because when we made them, it was my dad was buying Winklers and Lion Steels and uh, all these, you know, Medford knives. And, and eventually he was like, man, I'm tired of spending money on knives. So I'm just going to buy some stuff and make it. And I was like, this is perfect time for me to get into it. And, uh, so I started just getting out in the shop. And in fact, my first knife I modeled after a Winkler uh, belt knife, and it was absolutely horrendous. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so me and my brother started talking. We went to the Warren Cliff shape, and I've just never gone back. I mean, I literally use that style knife every single day. So, wow, your dad sounds like a, a true knife junkie too, man. Going going for all the the big ticket items there. Well, you know, we grew up at, um, not far from Boone, and my brother actually worked in Winkler shop for a while, which is where he kind of found his love for it. And I just, you know, uh, learned from him for a little bit and, and then just ran with it myself. Man, it's a, it's a small world, especially the knife world. So let's talk a little bit about how you um, how you make a knife and what your design process is. I've noticed lately that your as i mentioned up front your your design range has um expanded mm -hmm. so tell me about about how you design a knife and then and then i'll ask you when you're done telling me that about how you actually go about making them but uh, the, these new designs what what goes into that uh so it, so it depends on what i'm trying to accomplish with a knife um there are some like some of my golf for popularity like uh the, the dynamics blades that are really popular i wanted to make a double-edged blade and so i've, I've kind of dabbled in that for a while and to make my own version um but most of what goes into it is what i'm trying to accomplish um and you know that's one of the top right there was and i'll probably never take that down because that's the original odin but um 
the uh, a lot of what goes into my process is what I'm trying to accomplish. Um, this knife right here that you're going over right now is what I carry on an absolute daily basis. It gives me the option to pier stab if I need to or a straight edge to really cut. And so um, I do try to design function for the most part. And then there are some styles like that Quaken that you just passed that I made because it's a popular style and I wanted to make one of my own. Um, and so when I'm designing a knife right now, the, the biggest thing for me is handle and the way the handle is and how you carry it. And so if you look through my design process through my knives, they've, my handles have changed drastically um, because I've just been working as hard as I can to come up with a good functional way to carry a knife where it fits in your hand naturally. Uh, and that's why the way that we sculpt our handles are the same on every single knife. And we call that our custom copperhead sculpting. I mean, it's going to be the same every knife that you go to because when it goes in your hand, I want it to fit like a glove and feel like it's made for your hand. And so the biggest design feature for us is the handle. Um, the, the knife, I always do just based off of, you know, what I'm trying to use a knife for. Um, but the biggest part for us is, is having that good functional, when you pull it out of your sheath, you know, that it's going to fit in your hand and it's ready to go. So. Handle. Uh, so I'm a daily fixed blade carrier myself. Um, but I live in a very suburb, I live a very suburban lifestyle. And, uh, so I, I don't carry it on my belt. I keep it tucked in my waistband. And to me, handle is huge. I, I have a, a, a large collection of fixed blade knives that are sized for daily carry, but I, I only find a fraction of them comfortable on a daily basis. Part of that has to do with like a huge part of that has to do with the handle, um, mm -hmm. how, you know, how it, how it carries next to my body because it's so close to my body. It's not offset by a by a, a, um, a belt or anything like that. It's, it's right up next to my body. So for me, I like it, um, a little bit shorter or, you know, I have my own preferences for my style of carry. What is your style of carry? And, and, uh, does, does the handle design play into that? Oh, absolutely. So I'm going to show you one of my knives that I've got sitting right here. And this is actually one of my newer designs. So a lot of times, like for instance, the church we go to, it's a big church. It's really packed. Um, and so you're in a tight, compact spaces all the time. So um, this little knife right here is one of my newer designs. It's the Sear. Um, and I, I designed it. If, if you followed long enough, I have a, a push dagger. And this is kind of based off of the handle of that. It's really made for your hand to fit. And honestly, I can get, I don't have huge hands, but I can get um, four fingers on there. And the way that I do it is I literally made that to my hand and hopefully to the point where your hand, cause you can see, I can, you can still get a little room on there. Um, and the way that I carry is I, I love appendix style. So I carry a, um, SIG P365 XL appendix. And I actually carry this little scout most of the time, um, on my appendix as well, uh, scout carry like this. So that way I can, I can reach and I'll actually pull it out of my sheath, um, left-handed. Uh, so that's one of the few, you know, designs that I've made to really in tight compact spots where you're talking about like where you can't really afford to carry a big knife or sometimes even carrying a vertical knife inside your waistband it's uncomfortable it'll take takes up a lot of space and so I I made that to fit a need for me um, to carry in those tight spots where I could still have function to get to my blade if I can't get quite to my gun my I carry outside the waistband but it's because of where it's at it's covered up and uh, I, but I can still get to it easily, and I'm not uncomfortable carrying it. Um, the uh, appendix style carry, or, or uh, so you carry it scout style, so that's horizontally on, mm -hmm. on your front. Um, this is an interesting thing because uh, uh, I've basically heard universally that's the best place to carry anything, any sort of you know weapon uh, that you plan on using in a pinch. Um, because it's the most accessible. Um, I used to think scout carry on the back was really cool. And I used to carry back there and then I fell on it once and I was like, that's not cool at all. <laughs> so I moved it over to the side and, and the side feels good, but, uh, you know, and I'm right-handed and it, it draws right-handed, um, just great. But, you know, reaching around with the left hand, not so easy, especially if you find yourself face down on the ground, uh, 
this knife, uh, by the way, you held that up, that knife too quickly. If you could hold it up so we could check it out and maybe hold it a little bit closer to the, yeah. oh, that's beautiful. Beautiful Warren Cliff style blade with a, with a, the sort of, um, uh, instead of that curved tip, you've got you've got that angled tip. It's it's beautiful. What what is that like a three and a half inch blade? Yeah, so it's six and a half inches overall. Um, okay. And for like kind of what you're talking about, I, I when I carried appendix style, when I pull this knife out, I'm pulling it out like this, mm. uh, and it gives me this option to come from here out if I need to. Um, so I'm not having to reach across my body to carry the appendix style. I just know what my hands are going to. So my left hand is going to my knife and my right hand is going to my gun. So, you know, it's, it's definitely something I've messed around with because um, I carry a lot and I hate being uncomfortable when I carry stuff, which is why um, I've, I've even changed my knives the way that I make them now. I mean, uh, let me see if I can get one of these. Um, so this is one of my newer knives here, but I mean, it's just really super thin. I use three sixteenths inch G10 and one eighth inch steel. This one's three sixteenths inch steel, but I want this knife to be super thin because it's my philosophy. So when I carry a gun, I'm carrying a gun that's super comfortable to carry, but can still accomplish the goal. And so I want a knife that's super thin, functional, and just easy to carry. And you don't even know it's there. So that's that's the design part for me. I mean, it's got to be comfortable, it's got to be functional, and it and it's got to find its place in my belt where it you know goes to the side. Okay, so that's a huge thing right there. That because you're talking to a crowd who does carry a lot of stuff, uh, uh, knives, of course. It's usually more than one, and then you got your flashlight, you got your keys, you got your phone. Some of us carry pistols, uh, you know a lot wallet there's a lot of stuff and then and then a lot of uh edc um fans if you will or you know that have a nice pen on them they also might have a fidget thing or a challenge coin like all this stuff on them so how do you convince someone that a fixed blade knife is the way to go yeah that's a that's a task in and of itself um I, i've got a couple people that have followed my page but they won't carry a fixed blade and and you know, I, I've learned in this community that people find what they like and whether it's the right way to go or not, they're going to carry what they carry. Um, I like a fixed blade because there's no moving parts. If, if I've got to get to a blade fast, I don't want to have to worry about flipping it open. It's same, same reason you want to have a round in your chamber if you're carrying a pistol. I mean, any extra motions that calls for, you know, a failure it's not something I want to deal with and, and you can practice all you want to. And, and then I'm sure there are guys out there that practice a ton with a, you know, um, a folding knife and would tell you that that's their great carry and, and good for them if they can do it. But I think when you're in, if you've never been in a adrenaline driven situation and know what that pressure is like, you know, it, there's a different story. That's one of the reasons I like some of these, the way some of these like gun companies are training now it, it's hands on, it's putting you in the action. It's adrenaline based. So you can feel that pressure um, because without that, you really don't know how you're going to function when you carry it. So for me, I carry a fixed blade one because I can make them. I'm working on folding blades right now for those that can't, but um, I like a fixed blade because it's just simple. Right. I mean, I can get to it. I, I've messed with my knives enough where I know where the edge is at. I know what I'm doing with them. And I don't have to worry about it folding down on my hand because I didn't lock it out right or anything like that. So for me, if you're carrying in an everyday carry for self-defense, a fixed blade makes the most sense. Find find the style that fits your needs the best, but stick with a fixed blade because it's simple. It's easy. And, you know, it's just a good tool, man. I I can't say enough about them. I do like a good folder every now and then, but I just carry so much fixed blade now that, that I probably, you know, I'm not going to spend my money on a folder anymore, but. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a sprawling folder collection. I love folders and some of them are, um, you know, uh, made for easy deployment, you know, like Emerson's and that kind of thing. Um, but since starting to carry fixed blades, uh, you know, several years back, I always consider that first my self-defense option if I'm going to use a knife for self-defense. And I've done 
you know, uh, a bunch of training on that over the years. And so I feel somewhat confident in my abilities, though pressure testing is the test. And thank God I haven't been put to that test. But uh, I think I would try and pass it with a fixed blade. And, you know, I'm always carrying several folders, but that's for a different reason. That's for yeah. that's for opening boxes and playing with. I mean, I, I hate to put it that way, but oftentimes uh, people who collect knives, such as myself, are, are interested in the materials, the design, the feel, the action, different things than you might be interested in if you're, you know, in your fixed blade. Oh, uh, right. I, you know. uh, so... Uh, yeah, so uh, for me, fixed blade equals self-defense. Folders equal, pretty, you know, everything else. Uh, oftentimes, it's not socially acceptable to just pull out a fixed blade and and use it. People, uh, you know, you get you get a bit of that. Uh, at least where I live, you do. Uh, but I've I've been working on normalizing it, so <laughs> we'll see how that works out for me. Uh, but okay, so let's talk about how you make these things now, uh, because you know, knife making it's something that you you um, came into not out of a great love of knives, but out of a real need. So uh, I would imagine, well, I, just tell me about your approach. Uh, well, it, it changes drastically. I mean, if you look at how I was making knives when I first started versus how I make them now, I mean, it's, it's a completely different ball game for sure. Um, really the, the thought process for me is steel. Um, and when I started, I was making with 1095, you know, ESEE made a lot of their bushcraft knives with 1095, and it was a good steel. Probably not the best steel to start with if you're starting into the knife making world. Um, but I liked it; it was a good durable steel, so I started with it. And then, as we started kind of shifting our mindset towards the, I guess you'd call it tactical world, or you know, we switched to ADCR V2 for the edge retention on them, and it's just a good solid steel. Um, so. The way we do it is we get stock steel in and, you know, we get it in bars and I, I basically just draw my designs on them. I use a bandsaw, I'll cut them out. And then we go through several different layers. Um, I've seen people do it several different ways. I um, bevel my blades before I do the heat treat process. So um, I get like a 85% bevel on them. I take a 36 grit bevel and I put the initial bevel on them and then it will go through the heat treat process, the normalizing process, the temper process. And then when I'm done with all of that, um, I come back and I'll put the final bevel onto it with a higher grit. Usually I go up to about 400 um, grit. I'm not trying to get a super polished finish on these. These things are made for self-defense. Uh, you know, I don't need you to see your, your uh, image in them. Um, and there are some knives that I will go a little higher on depending on what I'm doing. But, um, and then I, uh, sometimes knife making is just messing around. Um, like that sear that I showed you a little bit ago. Um, that's like a nail polish finish trick that I learned from somebody and I just wanted to try it. So we went through that. Um, but I acid etch all my blades after we go through, um, the, uh, temper, um, and after I acid etch them, I go to a black oxide and depending on how I'm going to finish the blade, whether it's going to be like a stone wash finish or just a black oxide, um, I will, uh, either seal them. Um, if, if you get Caswell, well, it comes with a sealer that comes on to protect the blade at the end. Um, and I'll either stone wash it before or after I go through that process. And then you just go into handle making, which is just, uh, for the most part, on most of my self-defense, I use G10. Uh, I have gotten into making work some custom knives where, you know, if you're just carrying a knife that you want to love, I'll actually make the handles myself, and you'll see some of the kind of the designs in them, um, depending on what colors you pick that you want in them, things like that. But for the most part, you're getting this, you know, just G10. Um, I think G10's... For me, I stuck with it because my car to holds in, in Alaska, you know, if it gets wet, you're holding moisture. And so I wanted something that didn't really hold a lot of moisture, but was pretty good about durability. And I mean, G10, you can just oh, yeah. be death and it's going to it's going to work. Right. So it fits into that whole mold of of, you know, built for a purpose. Right. And so. Yeah, oftentimes uh, in testing. Um, this is not my own testing, but oftentimes in testing, it's the steel that will fail before the G10 fails. 
Yeah, uh, I've, I've heard that a lot with folder testing, um, especially like cold steel and companies like that that do abusive testing. Uh, it, it it turns out oftentimes it's the blade right near the Ricasso, you know, that, yeah. that breaks. Um, I want to go back a, a second to um, the beveling part. Uh, I, oftentimes people, I, I'll hear people say that they um, do all of the beveling after heat treat and and I always wonder about that as a non knife maker, because I do know that the steel is, is much harder after the heat yeah. treat. So you're going to go through more belts, but also you stand the risk of, um, you know, you got a lot of metal to hog off. Uh, if you're, if you're going for the bevel after the heat treat. So there's, there's a lot that you can kind of, uh, go through a lot of belts, but also you run the risk of ruining the heat treat by overheating the steel. I mean, I know people know what they're doing and they and they cool it as they go. But it just seems like a uh, a shorter process to, to do it the way you're doing it. Uh, how did you why did you start doing it that way? Uh, luck of the draw. I mean, you know, I, I, I when I started, I watched somebody on YouTube and I just kind of, you know, took my own process from it. But um the the part that i'm really picky about and if you ever came to my shop and worked with me um i'm very picky about how i do my heat treat and normalize um, part so because really where you mess up and where you're getting a lot of it, you get warps which is what a lot of people worry about when you um pre-bevel your blade right and so a lot of times people won't do that bevel beforehand because it makes the steel thinner which gives you more of a chance for it to warp um and that's generally caused by you overheating the blade as you're you know heat treating it now sometimes it could just be that the, you got bad steel or whatever it is that's causing it to warp uh, but i have a couple processes that i i have set up to ensure that one i heat treat with the light off so i'm checking that temperature based off i want it to be almost a salmon color right above um non-magnetic so i've got a magnet that i'm checking it with and then because i don't want a flame coming out as as soon as i hit the oil because if i do it generally means i got it a little too hot but for cases like that i have a vice set up behind it with some angle iron that i'll throw it into kind of help it cool back down into a straight um blade so that way you're not you're not messing it up and the temper will a lot of times take out that little bit that's left if it is but if you overheat those blades, that's where people are worried about. It's less work, I guess, you know, in, in the long run, you're taking belts and stuff, but you're not having to worry about warps or things like that. Um, and so, you know, it's just one of those things where I did it that way. And I got so picky about how I do my heat treats that, you know, it's easier for me to do it and have it mostly done. Cause when I come back and I, bevel it afterwards i'm running my uh my grinder on about 50 percent. i'm not even running it at 100 because i don't want too much heat on that blade um because your blade's important and you don't know it but you could accidentally get it way too hot without knowing it and take a lot of that stress add more stress into the blade and it's not going to be as durable so um and i'm not a, a, you know the world's expert i'm just going by my experience and what i've learned from doing this for a while is that you know, I, I just don't want a lot of heat on the blade after that temper process, right? Uh, the way you describe having the the lights off when you're heat treating, you know, it sounds very much like someone who forges knives, and that's you know how they check. Um, you know, and and it's it seems like a lot more old school, like the way it's been done for most of history. You know, you're doing it kind of by feel, by mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, so how, how much of the, but you're also doing stock removal knife making. Yeah. It, it's a kind of an interesting blend. What are you heat treating in? Is it, is it in a forge or is it a, like an even heat? No, I, I use a forge. Uh, if I had an even heat, I'd probably put out some, you know, S35 in or something like that. So, um, but I, I I'm old school. It was, and so I started in a forge and I just do everything in a forge. And, um, so I, I, that's just the process that I started and I've stuck to it, you know, and it, it's, a, it's hard because you want to change and you want to evolve, but you also know things that work and you want to stick with those things too. So you've kind of got this always balance of grow and change, but don't lose the heart of what you do at your company. And 
you know, it's, it's a balance for sure. I mean, that's a really cool blend. Uh, well, cool is it's, it's a very unique blend of those two processes. I don't think I've heard that before. Uh, maybe I have, but I, I like it because, you know, I've, I've, I've been in uh, shops when, where people are forging knives and uh, that's the part that, to me, when I first saw it, that was the part to me that seemed like the mystery of steel, you know, like at the beginning of Conan the Barbarian. It's like you don't have a machine beeping and telling you when it's ready. It's you got to have good eyes. What's the color, you know, and, and not everyone. It just doesn't seem like something that everyone would be maybe comfortable doing or familiar with or, or capable of, you know. Um, I, I like that. I like that blend. And, and then you talk about, well, how do you grow uh, with something that, that specific? You know, that there are different ways to automate certain parts of the process. Uh, but, but that, you know, the soul of the blade, the heat treat part, that, that could be the most difficult uh, place to automate or, or, or turn into a, a more, um, what am I trying to say? A more a prolific process. Like if you're trying to make more and more and more knives faster, 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 that's the part where it would slow down. Where where are there uh, places um, to automate in your process um, still maintaining that part of it? The heat treat's really the only thing I'm super picky about. I mean, I, I do whatever I can to speed up the process anywhere else. Uh, <laughs> But I have this philosophy, and I've talked to several knife makers who do not share this, so this is just me, but I, I think the heat treat is the heart and soul of the blade, and your knife is only as good as the heat treat, so that's the part that I, I'm going to do the same pretty much all the time. Because um, I've had guys suggest, you know, sending them off to other companies and having them do it, and I just, there's something about that for me. It doesn't feel like my knife at that point. Uh, but, you know... I, I spent money in getting a good bandsaw so I could cut everything out with metal where I was, you know, taking an angle grinder or a grinder and cutting it to shape. And so time is money and I, I'll do anything I can to save time. But there are aspects where I kind of try to keep it traditional for myself as well, you know. And so it's this weird balance that you find yourself in where it's like, how do I stay true to who I am and still adapt enough to to really move forward because uh, the biggest struggle for me is knife styles. I mean, it, the style of knife I make is not the most popular knife style out there. And there's been plenty of times where I'm like, I just should go with what's popular and make that and sell that. And, and I've had to say, no, you know, this is how we started. This is how we're going to stay because like, I've got all these cool knives over here that I don't carry because they don't fit my blade style and I'll make them, you know, um, uh, like it, like I showed you this vengeance. This is the newer model, but this used to be one of my most popular blades that sold. And I just, I love the blade. It's a great blade. It feels good in my hand. I just don't carry it because it doesn't, it doesn't fit for me. And so, um, I've tried to keep true to how I started where I want to be and, and, and maintain sight of that. And just hopefully people, along that time uh, along as long as i'm making knives will eventually say hey there's a reason we're they're doing things this way you know and, and it is hard because you see all the, the a lot of times you see one style of knife come out and everybody starts making that style of knife right and and i've tried to avoid doing that but it is hard sometimes not to jump on that train as well so what do you what do you think those popular styles are um, I, I don't necessarily know that I'd go by styles. I, I think sometimes it's more companies. Um, people are going to do whatever certain companies are doing and they're going to try to make that style of knife. I mean, I think one of them you can definitely say for sure is, uh, Winkler people just, you know, he's so successful. Why not try to copy his style and you'll never copy him. I mean, no, no offense. Nobody's Daniel Winkler. Right. And, um, but I see it a lot with dynamics. People have tried to, copy that razor back. I mean, everywhere it's, uh, and, and I think the knife style is good. I, I'm not uh, nothing against that. I just, you know, somebody innovates some sort of style and then everybody else wants to do it and claim it as their own. Um, and I think that's where I struggle with the knife community a little bit, but I've seen other fixed blade, uh, makers struggle with the, with the Pical style of knife, you know, the tip down edge in style. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm personal 
adopter of that. I love Pical. It's I love I love all knives, you know, almost equally. But uh, you know, past couple of years, the Pical style knife because of Libre fighting and and uh, Ed Calderon and and also this idea that you can use it without. Um, you know, when you're in caveman mode, when you have the adrenaline dump kind of thing uh, has made them very popular. But I know some people just really dislike the, the concept and the design. And I, I totally understand that. Um, uh, you know, is that is that the kind of thing you're talking about, like something that has a flashpoint of popularity that you're like, eh, maybe I could make a couple of shekels? Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I mean, the Pacal style, I tried to do it myself. Honestly, uh, because of the way that I carry a knife, I mean, my first grab is, is, is here. So that knife made sense to me. I just could never make one that works <laughs> the way I wanted it to. So I, I left that one behind. But yeah, it's that kind of thing. Like, um, you know, Shivworks kind of came out with that clinch pick and and that thing took off. And then everybody's making those Pacal style knives. Right. And, and I think they they're great. So um, I wish I could figure out how to make one that I felt worked the way that I needed it to. But everyone I've done so far has just been a flop. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, um, uh, this, the bandwagon thing is kind of interesting. And, and also I, I feel like sometimes, um, knife makers, you know, start off with a fixed blade, uh, because it, in terms of process, uh, there's, there's less, um, engineering, you know, it takes, and, but there, there's always this pressure, like, Oh, I got to make a folder. Yeah. And, and, and what I can't figure out is if that pressure is something that you feel due to market forces, or is it something that a knife maker feels because they're a knife maker and they love knives and that's just another knife they could do. Well, I can tell you for me, so me and my brother, um, polite but dangerous tools we're actually doing this thing right now called a brother versus brother challenge and uh, what we're doing is we're coming up with this crazy you know challenge that we're both going to try to compete uh, complete and then just put them out and let the world see so in our first challenge we're actually doing a folder and for me it's more of expanding my skill set um because I, i've always struggled with monotony and jobs which is one of the reasons i love knife making um, if I get tired of a design, I just make a new one, right? I just go back to the drawing board and figure it out. And, and so I want to make a folder for me because I want to just, I want to be better. I, I want to learn more stuff. And if, if you've seen any of my blades from the time I started to where I'm at now, I mean, I'm consistently changing things to make them better. One, it helps me stay motivated and, and just in this business because I want to, make my stuff better for you, for me, um, for anybody that's carrying it. And, and so the folder thing, yeah, there's, there's some of that, like everybody tells me down here, cause I live in Georgia right now and nobody carries a fixed blade here. It's like, we got, you got a pocket knife. And so I do feel it at a point, but there's also a point where it's like, I want to see if I can do it. I want to see if I've got what it's made of. I don't have a mill. I want to see if I can do this without all the fancy tools and equipment and, and just see what I'm made of. And so I think there's a, it depending on the person, it's, it's, there might be some of that pressure, but some of it is just like, I want to expand my skill set, right? Yeah, 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 it, absolutely. And, um, well, what you were saying about monotony in a job and, and how you just kind of design something new, make something new when, when it's feeling monotonous is interesting to me because, uh, that, that brings you to a certain kind of business model because, there are knife companies out there like Chris Reeve Knives, who has, um, you know, several models and they pr have perfected them and they update them every 20 years or so. And they're just, man, you know, they're the best folders out there, you know, one might argue. Um, and then there are companies like Tops Knives, who, um, and, and I love both of these companies, like to the core of my being, but they're both very, very different. Tops Knives has 8 million billion designs and uh, most of them are available all the time. And there's, you know, a relatively small shop in the United States. So you have, you have this, uh, you know, huge body of designs and a small body of designs, two different companies. And what you're, the way you're describing kind of seems more like in that Tops um, vein where you're excited to try new designs and, and, uh, 
And so how, how do you see that uh, sort of instinct shaping your company as it grows, you know, across time? So it, I've got a couple of nights that I'm not getting rid of. That'll be always a staple in, in my, now I may change things like a little bit of the handle or whatever to make it a little bit more functional or whatever, but um, I got to make a buck too. Right. And so every now and then when, I just want to do something different and see how it works. I'll make something new, but like my Fenrir, I'm always going to make that knife uh, to me out of all the knives I've ever made. Um, it's my absolute favorite. Um, and do you, have, do you have one right there with yeah, you? So, yeah. Yeah. so um, mm -hmm. it, years ago um, when I was trying to get into uh, the knife world, I, I taught, I was, like I said, I was doing bell recovery at the time and, um, there's a guy named John, his, uh, Instagram handle is unique skill set. He's on a TV show. Now they live down here in Atlanta or Gainesville. And, um, I, I, he got me into bell bonds. And so I wanted to make him a knife and I made this knife called the Fenrir cause that's the name of their company. And it was terrible. <laughs> um, but at the time I thought it was the greatest knife I'd ever made. Um, and so I, I sat on that design for, I guess two and a half years now and just have looked over it, looked over it. And it's the only model of knife that I haven't revamped two or three times. Um, I have literally made that first one and it was a botch. And, and now I went back to the draw board for two years and put this one out. And when I say I carry it every day, unless I'm in a super tight compact place where I carry that little sear, uh, the fender is what I carry hike in. It's what I carry to the store and I carry the same way appendix, uh, scout carry. And it's just, to me, it's got both utility and tactical in it. And it's, it's so that, that knife will be a staple in my line as long as I can do it. It's not very popular. And I hate that because I feel like people are missing out on a, you know, a good style blade, but that's the one that I've, that I'll probably will never change. Um, uh, but and that one, and then I, you know, this vengeance I've made a couple of times, which is this, um, you know, my version of a, a Persian can jar. Um, and so I've got that one that'll stay in my lineup for a while and my Odin will be there forever. But, you know, when I get tired, I, I make little things like this knife right here. Um, this is a double edge yeah, we call it the ravager. Um, this knife actually started, uh, several years ago, I designed a knife for Raul Martinez, and um, this is the a couple years down the road version of it. So every now and then, I just bring back old models too and remodel them, you know, and put new paint on an old car and see how it does. Uh, that Fenrir, um, I, I have a feeling that Fenrir is going to take off. Uh, you've been posting a lot of pictures of that, and 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 that Damascus Damascus version that you just held up, and it is beautiful and and to me it seems like you know when i was talking in your intro about how i've seen your designs and your knives become more refined that's the one i was thinking of in particular because uh it just seems that way it seems more um well it seems like it took more work to perfect on the grinder um oh, yeah. and, and, and that's just you know me spitballing but uh, uh i think that's i think that knife will take off i i'm, I'm glad you're not gonna um get rid of that or or phase that out um that one deserves the full play um in terms of um going from uh bonds uh, you know bonds enforcement to full-time knife making what was that choice like well I, I i when we moved to alaska i stopped bell bonds anyways and i was just doing security um at probably the coolest store I mean, down here in the South, it would be the best store ever. I mean, it was a grocery store, liquor store, and a gun store all in one. <laughs> the, uh, and so, you know, I, I, when I was there, you're just fighting people over, I mean, knocking down shelves in the gun sections, trying to fight people who were stealing. And, um, you know, it, it, I was doing that in Alaska. And um, I don't know, my wife just was finally like, I was coming home from work from there and then I was spending hours in the shop. And I, so I was gone, 
sometimes like 18 hours a day. And she was finally like, I think it's time, you know, we take this full time and we stop doing it. And I was like, well, I'm not going to stop doing it. So might as well take it full time. And, um, and one of the biggest things that pushed us or a big reason that pushed us back down to the South is that getting materials that you need in Alaska there's some companies that do it Semper sharp. They, they seem to know how to get all this stuff. Uh, and he's a super nice dude, uh, lived right there in Wasilla too. But one of the biggest things for us was we couldn't get some of the stuff that we needed to make better knives. Uh, and so we just decided, you know, my wife's family lives down here and we moved back, but it, it was, uh, it was either, you know, security or knives and I like knives too much to stop. So yeah. And, and at a point, you know, you, you also, uh, if you have children or, you know, as you get older, it's like, I, I want to make sure that I come home every day and you can never make sure, but you can hedge your bets by not working security at a liquor yeah. gun store. <laughs> you know. Well, and you know, I, I'm getting too old to be fighting people. Um, you know, when I was younger, sure. That would have been my jam. Um, uh, but, you know, I, we got, I got into some knockdowns where it was like the next day it was hard for me to get out of bed. And uh, I just, it, it was one of those things I can make tools for people that want to do this. Um, but I messed up my knees so bad wrestling that, I, you know, it hurts me to fight people. And I just would rather do something that I can work with my hands and pick my own hours and still go to my kids' ball games and stuff. So, Amen. So how does your, how does your wife fit into the business? Um, she tells me if my stuff sucks or not. <laughs> so I, I generally I'll show her a knife when it's done and she will give me an honest answer. Now she doesn't know a lot about knives, but I get, I hate this knife quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> but, but she doesn't like straight edge knives either. And so, because to her, she's grown up around, you know, curved knives, hunting knives. And, and so she is not a fan of the straight edge. Um, you know, Warren Cliffs, Bird Beaks and, and stuff like that. And so um, she hates a lot of my stuff, uh, but she's very supportive. Um, and and she, I mean, honestly, if it was for her, I wouldn't be making knives. So, you know, she's a big part, more of a, a support part than she doesn't help me with anything. Uh, you know, it's my business. She's going to let me run it. But because I wish she would help me pack stuff up because I, I hate shipping stuff. Uh, but... Yeah, she's a big part and a, not a big part at the same time. Oh, that's that's you know that's kind of the best of both worlds in some ways. You know, yeah. you you get you get the inspiration you need, but you're also kind of uh, left to your your knife instincts. And um, you know, because if she were part of the company in a more um, you know design way, you might be making Bowies right now, you know, or or something <laughs> like that, you know. Anyways, my dad's wanting a Bowie, so I might have to make one here soon for him. Hey, man, I saw you made a tracker. So if you make a tracker, you got to make a Bowie. I mean, classic well, American knife. Listen, I'm a big I'm a big fan of the movie Hunted. Uh, right. And, so, you know, that kind of I've never made a tracker. And I just made this one off for somebody who ended up, you know, they came on hard times like a lot of people and, and couldn't get it. And so. Um, it's actually still sitting downstairs, but I do, I love a good tracker, but just because I, I like Benicio del Toro throwing one into a tree, right? Yeah. Uh, the hole he made in that tree, throwing that knife was always impressive to me. <laughs> so, oh yeah. That made me think I never needed a gun, just a knife, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Um, so as Vandrer Knives grows and into the future, this is, you know, this is your, your company, how do you, how do you want to see it grow? What do you want to see it turn into? That's a good question. I, honestly, my, my goal has just been to help people that need it. Um, and so, you know, I've always, I try to help, you know, if you local law enforcement around here and you need one, I, I try to help as reasonably as I can to get them into people's hands because I, I'm, I don't make a ton of money. And so I've got to make a little something off of them, but my goal is really just to be give tools to people that are in those spots that really need them. Um, and so I'd like to be more involved uh, down the road with, you know, law enforcement and, and military guys and just really um, 
helping there. That's kind of my heart. You know, I, I started my, my career as a detention officer for, uh, for South County Sheriff's Office in North Carolina and didn't last long before my wife wanted to move from North Carolina to Georgia. So um, I've always kind of had a heart for those guys. My brother was in the military for a long time. And so really that's why we shaped and designed this stuff. I mean, I, I would love for regular people to buy them too, because I think that they're worth it and they'll help you in a pinch and uh, but really want to just see guys that need good tools on their belts uh, pick some up you know but I, I think that's hard now because there's a knife company on every corner it's almost like churches in the south right so would you um what would it take uh for you to um give over some control over your product uh, if 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 you needed to or when you need to to hire employees and have someone else working on your knives, would that be a difficult step for you to take in terms of the knife making part? Oh no, I don't think so. I I, I think as long as so, uh, I think just setting up good policy and procedure to make sure that the stuff's being handled the way that I wanted to. If, if you know, you can't. I can't ensure you every time that something didn't happen in a blade. I mean, I can't see everything. And so um, just having, if I'd love to have eventually to the point where I needed other people to help me do it. Um, but I'm not at that point right now. And um, I, if I got there, I, I'm sure I could trust people to do it. I think that that's what makes good leadership is just being able to trust other people to do what you need done yourself. Right. And, and if you train people the right way, it'll be done the way that you want it done. Right. And if you get the right people in place, so, I would love to get to that point. Um, if I could stop getting banned on Instagram, I may could get there, you know, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I have no doubt you'll get there and especially with what you just said about leadership and being able to trust other people and delegate to other people. I, I think the, the difficulty some, sometimes knife makers run into is, um, their attachment to their work, um, more is more, can be more like an artist's attachment to say a painting or a sculpture where it has a certain pre preciousness where you're like, you know, this is my painting. No one else can do my painting. Right. Um, you know, and, and I, I totally, I can understand that uh, having, you know, been a painter myself. You know, I, I understand that instinct. Uh, but at the same time, well, like all the, the big time painters of, of the past, they had, that had uh, big shops full of painters who did all the stuff and they just did the hands and the faces and the hard stuff, you know, the horses and stuff like that. Um, but, but yeah, the, the ability to, to, to understand that you are making tools. I mean, your goal is to get these tools in the hands of people who need them, that you're making tools and that, you know, uh, you can trust someone to the process and, and trust in yourself that you've kind of passed it along properly. Right. Yeah. And I think it's one of those things too, is that, um, it, it, it's not hard to make a knife. I mean, it's, it's hard to develop the skill, um, and, and bring people into that, but I, I've always wanted to, you know, in fact, most of our stuff that we do outside of the knife world is, is try to develop people. And so that would be a big part for me is just, you know, I've, I always make the designs, right? Cause it's, it, you know, Van Rare is my, my heart and, and, but I would love to be able to help guys that have never made a knife before come in and, and off the street and just be able to make one. So, um, you know, I'd love to get to that point and just develop people. The knife world needs more knife makers. Uh, you know, we need more people style. We need, um, we need to develop this community. So I'd love to be a part of helping it make bigger and, 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 stuff like that so that's awesome I, I should have done this way earlier but any let me see every knife you have before you uh just just so that people know what we're talking about uh all right so i've got my my quick pick uh right here um i'm actually hoping that this knife i'll have a collaboration with um somebody later on down maybe in the next couple months uh that's my one of my newer style knives. I've got the sear that I showed you guys, uh, my fin rear. This knife is actually one of my favorites too. This is the tier. Um, I developed it so you could have a good, um, uh, this was before I finished the fin rear. 
Um, but so you have a good stabbing point, but also a, a good straight edge with a slight curve to it. So, you know, you've got good movement on it. Um, I carry this one quite a bit too. Um, and then I showed you my Fenrir. Show it again. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. This is, uh, this is my, my absolute favorite blade. Ooh. I got to carry it with, you know, scout strap on there. And then I've got, I brought this big beauty. Um, I don't sell a lot of these anymore, but you know, this Ooh. is one of my, my tomahawks that I made the iron side. Um, I've got a couple new axe designs coming out here pretty soon. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that because I love axes. Um, and then this is my vengeance. Uh, this was one of my more popular knives, but this is the newer model of this knife. So that's, that's all I got with me right now. But well, the, people, people can check out your, yeah, people can check out your website and your Instagram feed. And it, it doesn't uh, surprise me that, uh, that Ethan Curtis of Van Rur Knives likes axes. It kind of oh. makes sense, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, Ethan, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast and, and sharing this stuff and your experience uh, coming up in your knife career. It's been a great joy and greatly appreciated, sir. Hey, well, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's been a good time. My pleasure. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase, and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long-sleeve tee, and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle, and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a Knife Junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at thenifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your Knife Junkies merchandise at thenifejunkie.com slash shop. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Ethan Curtis of Van Rare Knives. Uh, I, I love that Viking style of knife. You know, I, I talk about it probably all the time, uh, but don't get sick of it. There's a, <laughs> there's a lot of great stuff out there. Uh, and and Ethan's um, a Fenrir, who is what? Fenrir was a wolf, right? A, he's a Fenrir is a wolf from from Nordic myth. I got to I'll ask him in the uh, extra, the interview extra that you can get on Patreon. Just go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon and you can hear interview extras from every guest we have on the show. And uh, I have a couple of other questions to ask him um, and we'll get to that shortly. Thanks for joining us here on the Knife Junkie podcast. Be sure to join us on Wednesday for the midweek supplemental and Thursday for Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on YouTube, also on Facebook and Twitch, whatever that is. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.